Okay, we're ready. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. <laughs> 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 demo goes up with me and like it's it's a it's a live stream god or whatever we want to say cool i'm just gonna make sure yeah <laughs> yeah you're making okay, sure cool. the, the logo is on the screen now no 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 it's i have a screen and i can hear back whatever we spoke on the live stream so just muting that <laughs> Cool, uh, I'm gonna start the recording. Cool, all right. So welcome folks, welcome everyone. Um, so good to be here on the second edition of Voice of Community uh, with uh, the man himself, Simon Stewart. Simon, we are uh, so happy and glad to have you um, at the Lambda Test Voice of Community. And uh, thanks for accepting our invite. It's very special special for us. The Voices of Community itself is a new initiative from Lambda Test, and we wanted to bring in a premium and uh, the much needed content for attendees, and uh, especially around the topic building Selenium uh, and the, all the lessons that you have learned personally. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of us in the world, uh, just like me, have made a career out of Selenium. So I'm hoping um, there'll be a lot of lessons. I've learned it uh, personally along with you uh, during my times I've spent with you. Thank you for being my mentor. Uh, so much I've learned. At, uh, during the open source times and uh, and on, especially on this session I'm, I'm i'm sure a lot of people will learn um, all the lessons that you got to share with us and uh, thank you again for joining us well uh thank you very much for inviting me give me one second as i share my screen yeah can you see that okay yes brilliant right well um yeah thank you very much for that kind introduction uh, as Manoj says, I'm Simon Stewart. Um, when Manoj approached me about doing this talk, I thought it would be fun to talk about some of the lessons I've learned from the better part of 15 years working on the same open source project. But the thing is that the more I thought about it, the harder it seemed to be to actually write the talk. My normal way of writing a talk is to start with a single point I want people to walk away with at the end. And then what I do is I sort of structure the talk around that. And, and by necessity, something we're going to be talking about, uh, we're going to be talking about today are the lessons learned. That can't be just a single idea or thought. Um, so we're going to have to do things differently this time, I, I think. Um, yeah. So let's start at the beginning. These are before and after photos of me. Uh, the first one was taken in, in New York in 2007, while GTAC, the Google Test Automation Conference, was going on. That was a conference where I first spoke about WebDriver in public. Um, the second photo is a year or two old. Um, it was taken around the time I made the decision to step down as project lead uh, once we'd shipped Selenium 4. Um, so uh, as you can see, I am less hairy now and I've lost the glasses. Um, but I'm still fundamentally the same kind of person, right? That said the scene a little. I started working on open source many, many, many years ago. I think my first commits were um, to, to a project were uh, some docs on how to use mod JK to hook the Apache web server uh, and Jetty, the servlet engine together. From there, I ended up getting interested in things like dependency injection when that was still a hot new buzzword. Um, and that led me to contributing to WebWork and then WebWork 2, which then became Apache Struts 2, um, which you may have heard of. At the time, it was tremendously exciting. You know, funnily enough, I, I think my name is still somewhere, somewhere buried deep in the Struts code base. So, I guess that's the first lesson that I learned from working in open source. Code, code lives forever. I think intuitively, we all know that even if it takes us an incredibly long time to write some code, it's likely to stay in our source repos and be active um, for significantly longer. A while ago, I had a friend in his early 30s who was making an absolute fortune working in COBOL for a bank. It turns out that the number of people familiar with, uh, with that language, with COBOL, and, and willing to work in it, is a slowly diminishing pool of souls. The people who do work in it can be handsomely rewarded. 
it turns out it's cheaper to pay a person to work on this legacy stuff than it is to replace it. When it comes to open source, I've still got code in struts, a project I've never directly worked on because web work got sucked into it. There are lines of code in Selenium that have remained unchanged since Selenium RC was first released all those years ago. I think I know for a fact that there are people out there who are actually still using Selenium RC. I mean, if it ain't broke, why fix it? So that is our first lesson of the day. Code lives forever. Now, I contributed patches here and there for a while to various projects, but the thing that ended up becoming the focus of my open source efforts was WebDriver and then Selenium. It's been a wild ride. I first pushed the code from the comfort of my sofa while drinking a glass of wine on the 3rd of January 2007. In fact, I remember it very clearly. I had my feet up and I was basically prone on the sofa. It was very relaxing. At the time, I was working at ThoughtWorks, and I seem to recall that I believed it wouldn't take that long to get WebDriver to a decent state, and then I could move on to something else. You know what they say. Never trust an engineer's estimates. And that's true in this case. My estimate was wildly incorrect. A few months has ended up being over 15 years, which leads me on to the second lesson that I've learned over all this time. Just because it looks easy doesn't mean it is easy. There are plenty of examples of this over the lifetime of the Selenium project, such as um, how Jim Evans got involved with the IE driver. That's him on the left of the screen, by the way. Back in the day, I'd written the code for the IE driver. If you're not familiar with how it works, and why should you be, the short story is that IE Internet Explorer isn't really a browser. It's a series of com components dressed up in a trench coat and pretending to be a browser. For those of you who didn't grow up in the heady days of the late 90s and early 2000s, com was Microsoft's component object model. It was a way of describing software components and how they would interact with each other. It was a kind of neat idea. And the root interface in all this was called iUnknown. Digressing a little bit, Mozilla liked the approach that COM offered, took the idea and ran with it, coming up with cross-platform COM or XPCOM. The root of their interface was also called iUnknown, had the same UUID as the one from Microsoft's COM. The idea was they were going to be interoperable. Now, after shipping COM, Microsoft also offered a distributed version of COM called DCOM, distributed COM. Mozilla were going to implement distributed cross-platform com, distributed XP com, and got as far as writing a server socket for it before giving up on that idea. That server socket that they wrote for DXP com was the basis of the original Firefox driver. But like I say, I digress. Back to the story about Jim. I would thought that writing some C to, to call the com components would be easy. And with the confidence of someone who didn't know how hard the task was going to be, I beg your pardon, um, I'd made it work. Actually, this meant that the code that I'd uh, written for the IA driver was absolutely terrible. I mean, it was a appalling code. Someone at Google reviewed it once and exclaimed that they were amazed it even compiled. Now, Jim is far wiser than I am. He took one look at that code and for a long time protested that he wouldn't try and clean it up because getting it to work was far more complicated than anyone would expect. He was wrong about not cleaning it up, but he was entirely right about how complicated it was. Jim still writes code in the IE driver all these years later. It looked like making IE do things would be easy. It most definitely is not. Another example of something looking easy but being terribly complicated was the simple matter of handling alerts in Selenium. Now, in the original Selenium RC, what you would do is you would say, when you see this alert, perform this action, and this is how you will handle it. And, and the way that that happened was because they needed to override some of the internal uh, functions in, in window, such as alert and prompt. With WebDriver, we wanted an API that was reactive. You do something, 
the browser shows an alert and you respond to that alert. Oh, sounds simple, right? Let me assure you, it was fiendishly difficult. I remember having a very long and involved conversation with David Burns and some of the other members of the team about how to implement it in Firefox. I'd been chewing on the idea for a long time and I thought I had a workable design, but it took a lot of explaining. At the end of the conversation, we all agreed that the design should work. David was going to have a go at implementing it. Ten minutes after we parted company, he messaged me. While the idea had been clear and solid while we were together, code is shape-shifting and ever-changing. We needed to talk it through again. Going even further back, implementing alerts was something I talked about in that GTAC presentation in 2007 when I introduced WebDriver to the world. I literally said while I was there on the stage, oh, in the next commit, this will all be working. But it only really became a reality as we worked on the WebDriver spec. So yeah, sometimes the things that look easy turn out to be hard. And that leads me to the next lesson that we're going to talk about. There's power in cooperation. There's a well-known expression that if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And I think this can be applied to a lot of things. For the sake of us here, right now, I'm going to apply it to working on Selenium. But you can do it with whatever you want to. For a start, there's no way that Selenium would be where it is now without cooperation. In the early days, it was Jason Huggins cooperating with Brett Petticord, which managed to get Selenium out into the world. Brett was the one who announced it on a mailing list. Jason was the one who ended up doing a lot of the work, but Brett was the one who made the announcement. It was Paul Hammond's encouragement and support that ensured that I actually made WebDriver open source and pushed the code. I'd been working at ThoughtWorks. I had this nice little browser automation tool. We had an option. We could have turned it into a private product and sold it. We could have turned it into a tool that you would get if you worked with ThoughtWorks, or we could have made it open source. And Paul was the one who was like, Let's make it open source. So the first sub lesson is that people matter and the relationships we have also matter. Let me take you back to 2007. Jason Huggins had created Selenium and it was already pretty popular. We'd both worked at ThoughtWorks at the same time and our paths had crossed a couple of times there, but it wasn't until GTAC that we actually had a proper chance to sit and talk. When I joined Google later that year, Jason was assigned to me as a buddy, someone to help me navigate those first few weeks at the company, figuring out how things worked and how to get things done. At the time, Google still had its fabled 20% time. This was the company time where an engineer could focus on their own project. Um, if you are unfamiliar with the idea, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, there is a book by a chap called Mal Malcolm Gladwell called Slack, not to be confused with the well-known chat application um, called uh, called Slack. It is well worth reading. It suggests giving people about 20 to 30 percent time to do performance improvements and figure out ways of, of working things. It suggests that when you run a team at full capacity all the time, you don't get greater efficiency. You just get an exhausted team. So going back to Google 20% time, I knew that my time would be spent on WebDriver. The thing is, Google were making a big push with Selenium. One of the senior engineering managers suggested that I should focus on that instead. But Jason and I, along with the rest of the Selenium team from back then, had already hatched the diabolical plan to merge the two projects. So. I promised to work on Selenium, and I guess what I said was true. It wasn't necessarily what people were expecting. We shipped Selenium 1.0, then merged the projects, and the rest, as they say, is history. Except it didn't end there. By the end of the first decade of the 2000s, there was a thriving world of browsers. The biggest and most popular of them all was Internet Explorer had something like 96% market share at one point. Everyone used that, except for the Mavericks who used Firefox, the small, light and fast browser. 
But there was another browser that was popular around that time, based on the Presto engine. It was called Opera. One of the things that made Opera special was it adhered closely to the W3C standards that were already out there. It was small, fast, compatible, and adored by those who used it. That group of people was smaller than it should have been because it turns out that, just like today, people tended to only test on the most popular browser, Internet Explorer, and not on the smaller ones. Naturally, um, Opera were somewhat frustrated by this and were keen to improve the situation. I remember a conversation at Google where they wondered how we could get more people running Google's own tests with Opera. At the time, I was part of the team that was hoovering up all the different web testing frameworks and consolidating them onto Selenium 2 and a JS-based framework that used the same atoms from the Selenium project where possible. And so this is the next lesson. The path to success is long and filled with hard work. I was saying to earlier to Manoj that I'm not a particularly insightful per person. I'm sure you've heard this before. The way that we gathered support for Selenium WebDriver at Google was to talk to people. I had a presentation that I could do on a whiteboard at the drop of a hat. It was called the timeline of a bad idea. That timeline always began with, ah, so you've noticed there's a JavaScript call for calling click on an element. And then it walked through the various trials and tribulations that people were experiencing trying to get their framework working. Ah. You've noticed that it doesn't fire all the events. So I guess you've got some wrapper where you fire the events. Ah, but now you've noticed that sometimes those events aren't trusted. So what are you going to do? Ah, you've noticed that you can't travel between domains. Ah, well, you're going to put in a proxy server to do that. The talk always ended up with something along the lines of this is the current problem you're dealing with, and this is how you're trying to fix it. And invariably, people will go like, yes, and how did you know? The offer that we'd make to people is that we would help them keep the APIs they'd been working on. That was the thing they really cared about. But we'd work to refactor those APIs away from their homegrown framework onto ones that my team worked on. So Selenium or that JavaScript stuff. It turns out that writing and maintaining a browser automation framework is a lot of hard work. It also turns out that not many people want to do it. Most teams working on these frameworks just wanted to go back to working on something fun, like testing their own products. We were successful because we were willing to work hard on the right things, and we were happy to work with people to help them to focus on the things that they cared about. The history of Selenium is littered with examples of the same thing. Water used to be entirely separate, but Yari Bakken, and this is a relatively recent photo of him, worked damned hard to convince the rest of the water team that migrating to build water on WebDriver was the right way to go. He pitched in with the Selenium project to make that happen. I still remember clearly he arrived at a hackathon we were doing at a conference, sat down next to me, and in the space of two or three hours, basically replicated a month's worth of work um, that I'd done in Java, but he wrote it in Ruby. It was an astonishing piece of programming. By being based on WebDriver, it allowed Water to work with every browser that had WebDriver support and lets them focus on the things that matter most to them. Having an API and philosophy for how things should feel to the person using their APIs that's very different from Selenium's. People have worked so very hard to make that happen, and that work has paid off. I've noticed the lights are dimmed. I need to just step back, and when I come back, the lights will be on. Hold on. Wave my arms. There we go. Perfect. The motion sensor is about like five feet behind me. But there's another lesson to do with hard work and cooperation. And that is that writing a spec is both necessary and incredibly demanding. As I was saying before, it was Opera who opened the door on turning the WebDriver API into a W3C spec. They wrote their own Opera driver which was astoundingly fast and solid. And then someone, probably Andreas, suggested we work with the W3C to make it a standard. I still remember when Andreas demoed the uh, Opera driver for the first time at SelenumConf. 
the room was quiet he ran the test and somebody went swore quietly in the audience and it was like yes that is exactly the right response it was incredibly fast the idea of working with the w3c was a stroke of genius you see writing a browser automation framework that binds tightly to a browser in the same way that webdriver does is a massive technical challenge it was hard enough with firefox but at least that was open source and we could delve into its code to understand how it worked similarly while it was really difficult with ie at least the documentation for the com objects we were using was astoundingly well written and thorough microsoft do great documentation but there was no way for us to crack open safari or opera even getting support for webdriver into chrome was an uphill struggle and we were in the same company and while it worked I, I don't think any of us were as happy with our support for chrome as we were with the firefox driver before chrome driver arrived however a standard offers something else entirely by agreeing to the shape of the protocol to be used and what each command should do People working as part of the team writing the browser could implement anything and everything that needed to be done. And guess what? The people working on web browsers are amazing engineers. They know the way their browser works and they know how to make it do whatever needs to be done. They can get the permission and the support that's needed to make browser automation sing. But a spec is a hard thing to write. Hopefully, all of you know how hard it can be to express yourself in code, to make a machine do what you want it to do using a language stripped of complexity and richness and designed for a computer. Writing a spec is much like writing a program, but instead of something that's tightly constrained like a regular programming language, we have to do it using a wonderfully imprecise and messy language, English. Worse. You need a sort of loyally understanding of how your spec relates to others that have already been written. How can you express ideas in the most elegant yet unambiguous way that requires the least amount of additional engineering? We were very lucky that in the team of people working on the WebDriver spec, we had people like James Graham, Andreas Toftolson, and more recently, Sam Snedden, who had this kind of strong grasp on what's already there and how we can use it. Even with those people and with the support of the browser vendors, it still took us seven years to run the spec. It was a relief when we finally shipped the 1.0 version of it. During that time, we had plenty of discussions and arguments, agreements and misunderstandings and understandings. Sometimes it was hard work, but it was always rewarding. Working with people of that caliber was fun. And on the way, I made some great friends. And that leads me to my next lesson. Understand that friends come and go, but for a precious few who you should hold on to. That line is from the Baz Luhrmann song, Everybody's Free to Wear Sunscreen. The lyrics for that were taken from a column from the Chicago Tribune, which is shown here. The URL is up at the top, written by Mary Schmidt. Which, uh, which was called Advice, Like Youth, Probably Just Wasted on the Young. The whole thing is littered with good advice, some of it trivial, such as a reminder to floss, and some of it thoughtful and provoking, such as get to know your parents. You never know when they'll be gone for good. Be nice to your siblings. They're your best link to the past and the people most likely to stick with you in the future. But... The one line that stands out for me in that piece, other than the advice to wear sunscreen, is understand that friends come and go, but with a precious few, you should hold on. Work hard to bridge the gaps in geography and lifestyle, because the older you get, the more you need the people who knew you when you were young. The Selenium Project has been a source of friendship and support for me over all these years that I've been part of it. When I started writing WebDriver, I was in my late 20s. I pushed the first lines of code before my 30th birthday. At the time, I wasn't married and was working for ThoughtWorks. My health was fine. Over the lifetime of the project, I've been married, got divorced, married again, 
I've become a father. I've moved jobs. I've moved home. I've moved home again. I've had three heart operations, and that was really scary for a time, but I think I'll be okay. Life has been filled with ups and downs, the kind of patchwork chaos that we all experience. While I've been doing that, others on the project have also been growing and learning on their own journeys. Sometimes we've been lucky enough to be part of that. We met Hacking on Code, but the people working on Selenium did a lot of growing up together. Oh, by the way, this, this is a Twitter conversation that happened recently between some of the uh, committers on the project. And if you're interested in the dates of those files, they were early 2010. If I tried to name all the friends I'd made on this journey, I'd be bound to forget people. So I'm not going to try, but Manoj for sure is definitely one of them. These friends have also been on their own journeys, but we've experienced a lot together. One of the great joys of the first Selenium Conf was that it was the first time that some of us had actually met in person. Back in the day, we coordinated a lot of work on the project via email and IRC. We do the same now, but on Slack. To begin with, the people who sent code were people that I'd met in real life and had talked to. They were my friends. But that changed when Michael Tam started sending patches for the Firefox driver. Suddenly, there was someone contributing code to this thing that I had no idea who they were. And over time, that number grew. I still remember some of the early conversations with people like Jim, uh, who wrote the IE driver and, and has looked after .NET. David, who uh, looks after the Python driver. Titus, who is a powerhouse and is just pushing a whole load of features recently. And Yari, who basically built the, R, uh, the Ruby bindings from scratch, amongst others. But the thing with IRC and email is that while you get an impression of how people are, no real idea of what they look or sound like. And Selenium Conf changed that. Each conference, we finally had a chance to put names and faces to IRC handles, and it is joyous. Getting to spend time with people in real life rather than just virtually is a wonderful experience. Some of the ways that people write or express themselves become clearer once you've actually met them in person. You can sometimes hear what they're writing in their voice. So yes, over the lifetime of the project, I've had a chance to make some brilliant friends. But I'm also terrible at following the second piece of advice in that lesson. I'm awful at keeping in touch with people. I really should do more to stay in touch with them. Well, at least there's something I can take away from this talk, right? Well, I suspect these last few minutes aren't quite what you were expecting. Also, I'm English, and that national stereotype is to avoid talking about things like that. I mean, stereotypes are bad in general, but perhaps just this once, we can pretend they're a guide to life. <clears throat> so uh, what other lessons have I taken away from building Selenium? Um, perhaps some technical ones. Well, one lesson is that code is endlessly plastic and entirely disposable. You can shape it and change it as much as you'd like. You can try out an idea, explore different ways of solving a problem, and each time you can keep the learning and throw away the code. The trick, you see, is to be unafraid of deleting code. The first time you solve a problem, it's very unlikely you've solved it in the most reliable or elegant way. Your solution likely has bits left over from wrong turns and dead ends, the digital equivalent of your own appendix. The important thing left over from these explorations is the knowledge you have of the problem and what the best solution may look like. And the nice thing is, once the code is written, you can always change it again. That's what I mean when I say code is plastic. It's never set in stone. There's always a way to flex or change what it does or how it works. <clears throat> Take, for example, the Selenium server. In the original Selenium release, the only thing it did was to act as a proxy for commands to reach the JavaScript code that was the heart of Selenium RC, which was running in the browser. While we were working on Selenium 2, Francois Reynard, while working at eBay, offered an implementation of Selenium Grid to the project that worked with both Selenium RC and the WebDriver protocol. I mean, it was great. We loved it. And Christian Rosenwald, in particular, spent a lot of time making it thread safe and solid. 
but we didn't delete the old server server no <laughs> you see the new server was essentially a complicated set of servlets and the original server was running in jetty a servlet container so we just mashed everything together there was a switch statement near the start of the main method that started the server in either the original rc mode or in the new harbor no or node mode or in standalone mode you really didn't want to see how we implemented this now for years we knew that what we were doing was less than ideal it was a less than perfect design for one thing people would raise a bug we'd fix it in one server in one mode but not in another so we'd play whack-a-mole with the issues it was a real headache for another it wasn't nice to look at that switch statement was definitely a hack finally the code was kind of hard to read and understand. There weren't many people on the project who were confident delving into it and fixing issues. All this meant was that the issues kept piling up and it was getting harder to move. But plasticity. We could change this, right? And so we did. One of the reasons Selenium 4 took a while to ship is that we rewrote the entire server. We took the lessons we learned and applied them to the new tree. Now, when you start the server in standalone mode, what you're really getting is a fully distributed grid, but all running in the same process. All we've done is make the boundaries between the parts of the system clear, and that allowed us to bolt them together however we want. And that leads me to the next lesson. We should favor simplicity don't shy away from complexity. As the example of the Selenium server shows, there is some complexity inherent in anything that we do. People who are far smarter than me like to talk about the difference between essential and accidental complexity. Essential complexity describes how hard something is to do. It strips out every superfluous requirement or need and reduces the solution to a problem to the bare minimum the simplest possible solution. Sometimes that simple solution is necessarily complex. For example, for us to be able to fix a bug in one place and know that it works for the Selenium grid, no matter how it's deployed, we arrived at a, at, at a solution that is hard to describe as simple, yet there's not much that's not necessary in it. Accidental complexity, on the other hand, describes the problems and challenges that engineers and software developers introduce to their software by accident. You see it all the time. As an example, I was once in a meeting with some of the other SETs. Our manager asked us how we were going to go about writing the tests for a particular project. A handful of people said they'd begin by writing a framework to write the tests in. Then, once a framework was complete, they'd use that to write the tests. This approach is rife with opportunities to introduce lots of accidental complexity. How do you know that this particular, fi particular feature or toggle should be needed? How do you know this thing is needed? That leads me to my next lesson. I've just noticed this is perceived in actual safety. I shall be talking about that later. APIs and frameworks should never be written from scratch. Instead, they should emerge naturally from the work we're doing. That may not be obvious advice, but something that I truly believe, and it's something I try and live by, not least in the Selenium project. The WebDriver API is an example of this approach, embodied in full. You see, what you're using now is not my first attempt at writing the API. I've told various versions of the story about how it was created a few times, but I could tell it one more time, right? It all started while I was working at ThoughtWorks in Australia in 2004 or 2005. At the time, we were using a tool called HTTP Unit, which was a pure Java web testing tool, and a colleague and I were discussing the design of its API. My claim was that although it wasn't particularly tidy, it was fine. My colleagues was that it failed to adhere to basic object-oriented design principles, and so it wasn't great. After that conversation, I wrote a simple wrapper over HTTP unit, which presented a basic object-oriented design. Over time, we iterated on the design of the thing as it started out being very, very simple. One of the nice things about working at ThoughtWorks is that you can move from project to project pretty easily. 
On every project, I applied the same design principles, but did so using the unique pressures that each project applied to the design of the API. Slowly, ever so slowly, I came up with an API that felt pretty nice. It was then that I was on a project with Joe Warns. He'd been on a similar journey. While my API had a web element and a browser, his approach replaced browser with WebDriver. I loved the name. And so on that project, that's the name we used. Now, that project had also started testing using HTTP unit, but the rough edges were showing and people weren't particularly happy using it. Fortunately, there was a replacement called HTML unit that performed better and was updated frequently. It looked like a good bet for us to use. We'd written all our tests using the API that Joe and I had developed. So one day I switched the implementation of that API to use HTML unit instead of HTTP unit. No one noticed for a few days. And that's when I knew we'd evolved a nice API. It was also while working on that project that the concept of actual and perceived safety became important. See, I told you I'd get to it. Actual safety is, does this thing work? Whereas perceived safety is, do I believe this thing works? It turns out, while the developers had roughly the same levels for these two kinds of safety, the people who were assessing whether or not the stories were working on were actually complete had dramatically lower perceived safety. Yeah, how to fix this problem? We did it the easy way. By taking our fledgling API and backing it with a real browser, we used a framework called Jacob IE to do that. And while it was slow, it worked well enough for us to help uh, help people feel comfortable to raise their perceived safety. Um, incidentally, the name of that framework is one of the reasons why we used to call the IE driver Jobby. That isn't the only reason, but it's the PG rated reason for the story, uh, PG rated version of that story. Once the project was over, I went back to the drawing board and rewrote WebDriver from the ground up. So rather than creating the API just by thinking very hard, it grew from how people wanted to use it. Indeed, the API still shifts and changes based on that. Here's a version on the left of the original WebDriver interface. You may not be able to read it, but it's very tiny. It has evaluate JavaScript on it. Um, select element, select text, set visible. You used to be able to make the browser visible and, um, and not. You can see we've been making changes to it ever since we shipped the project, because on the right, you can see the current version. You know, originally, you were going to be able to do more than just navigate to a URL. I wanted the WebDriver interface to allow you to perform other HTTP verbs like post or delete. That's why the get method is called get. Lights to me. Thank you. So frustrating when that happens. Well, I, all these lessons are good, but the abstract for this talk promised we'd look to the future of the project as well. So I'd be remiss if I didn't do that too. Now, before going any further, I should point out that I stepped down as lead of the Selenium project shortly after we shipped 4.0. I hung around long enough to know that we'd not accidentally blown everything up. But then I let other people take the lead. I've been making a really conscious effort not to try and influence the direction of the project. Because of that, take everything I say here as the ramblings of a man shouting at clouds and not as this is what the project will be doing. Although I will be describing lots of what the project is doing. No work ever happens in a vacuum and Selenium isn't the only tool in the world for browser automation. Back when we started the project, there are a wide range of alternatives available. Yet over the years, they tended to disappear. Partly that was because writing a browser automation tool is an incredibly demanding task. Partly that's because, uh, especially once we had the WebDriver W3C spec, we'd succeeded in commoditizing a certain level of browser automation. People could work with different user-facing API designs, but each and every browser offered the same affordances for automation. Times have changed though. For a while, there were many browser engines, Trident used by IE, WebKit used by Chrome and Safari, Gecko used by Firefox and Presto used by Opera. The dominance of IE was broken and there was a wealth of browsers. Nowadays, we're slowly sliding back to a world where there are fewer browser engines available and consequently less diversity in the browsers available. Trident and Presto are gone, 
from WebKit, Blink, used by Chrome and the Chromium-based browsers, was forked. Depending on the platform, usage numbers for Chrome are staggeringly high, although not, I should note, as high as IE ever got. In any case, I'm sure we've all come across people who insist that they only need to test in Chrome and it'll be fine. That kind of attitude makes me endlessly sad. Still, it's there and it's something we should be aware of. The other thing to consider is that we've known from the beginning there was more that we could do with WebDriver. The main thing, which I mentioned in the very first public WebDriver talk at GTAC in 2007, was the ability to do bi-directional communication. It turns out there's an awful lot that happens inside a browser, and being able to be notified of a change of state within it can be incredibly useful. And there's a way to get hold of this information that's already available. Simply hook into the debugger for the browser and all the information you need is there. And that's what happened. Tools like Puppeteer and Playwright take this approach. The big downside is you tie your test to one version of one browser. We already know that some people have already given up on the idea of the open web and only bother to test in one browser, but the version thing is troubling even to them. Ignoring that bi-directional communication, something people want, is foolish. But the debugging protocols were never designed for browser automation. Sure, they can be made to work, but they have their drawbacks. Like I said, the protocols are necessarily tied to one version of one browser. After all, they're primarily designed to be used with the DevTools UI, which each web browser ships with. That means that the protocols aren't designed with a conciseness in mind. They're chatty protocols that like to send a lot of data backward and forward. When you're doing so within the same process or over a socket and localhost, that's fine. There's virtually no lag and things romp along. Once you put the internet in the way, however, you have a problem. Tools like Lambda Test allow your test to run locally, accessing necessary resources on your machine or on your corporate network, while still allowing you to use a browser remotely. Every single message or command to the browser now has to traverse from your machine across the internet into Lambda Test infrastructure to the browser and then potentially back again. And chatty protocol and remote testing don't play well together. How do we fix this? Uh, it turns out that applying some of the lessons we've learned would help. The first lesson to apply is this power in cooperation. The browser vendors would like people to have a great experience when using their browsers for testing. People working on browser automation frameworks would love a stable and easy mechanism that they can rely on. And that leads us to apply the second lesson. Writing a spec is both necessary and incredibly demanding. With a well-written spec, we can solve these problems. And sure enough, that's what's happening with WebDriver BiDi. It's an attempt by browser vendors and people from testing frameworks, such as Selenium and Puppeteer, working together to try and formalize a bi-directional protocol that builds upon the success of the WebDriver spec. Now, as you know, frameworks and APIs shouldn't be created out of thin air. They should be extracted from existing tools that people are already using. And again, this is a lesson that's being applied in the creation of WebDriver BiDi. As a starting point, we're taking the Chrome debugging protocol, the CDP, that lots of tools depend on, and we're working hard to regularize it and make it less chatty. Why would we do things this way? Because oh, there are plenty of things that are working well with the CDP, and it would be foolish to throw away all that effort in a bid to solve other problems. But while we're working on this, we're also applying another lesson. We're striving for simplicity, but we're not shying away from complexity. It turns out that creating an expressive bi-directional communication pro protocol and specifying how it should work has a pretty high level of necessary complexity. Of course, we're working hard to avoid adding more accidental complexity to the solution, but a spec already looks daunting to anyone who's not knee-deep in the work already. So one part of the future of Selenium is going to be the W3C WebDriver by die spec. I'm really looking forward to this continuing and shaping up. Early work in supporting it is looking promising. But that's not the only thing that's being improved in Selenium. You see, for a long time, we viewed Selenium as being a browser automation tool. We still see it that way, but one of the things that we've learned from tools such as Cypress and Puppeteer again is that people really value a simple way to spin up everything they need. You see, with Selenium out of the box today, although you have all the APIs you need to do interesting things, you still need to be responsible for making sure the browser is available and the right version of the driver for the browser you want to use is also installed. For many people, that's a lot of complexity that they view as accidental, 
After all, with Puppeteer and Playwright, you install and voila, everything you need is installed. The Selenium suggestion has always been to use a third party tool such as WebDriver Manager to handle this complexity. But that means that people need to handle that complexity themselves. And that's not always as easy as we think it should be for people. Fortunately, we can apply the lesson of cooperation. Bernie Garcia, who was the primary author of WebDriver Manager, uh, uh, was the primary author of WebDriver Manager, beg your pardon. So the Selenium team did the sensible thing and are working together on a new tool called Selenium Manager to handle the complexity of juggling the various browsers and driver versions. The nice thing is that rather than having it as a standalone tool that you'll need to handle yourself, the Selenium team are going to be shipping Selenium Manager as a core part of Selenium itself. The vision is you'll add a dependency to Selenium on your project and behind the scenes, you will download the browser and the driver for you. Suddenly, a whole class of problems will go away. I think that's something that'll be one of the nicest changes we've seen in Selenium for a long time. I'm looking forward to it happening. And as the final thought, as we consider the future of Selenium, I think it's interesting to note how the project is being run now. One of the things we saw in the last few years of my time as a project lead was, was us setting up the project leadership committee and the technical leadership committee. These are groups of people who are deeply connected to the Selenium project and community and are on the lookout for ways to improve the project. I'm a huge fan of this kind of cooperation, and I think it's paying off for the project already. For example, this was a structure that led to the idea to include Selenium Manager as part of the project. So that's a quick look at some of the things that will happen in the future of the project. I am, as ever, very confident that Selenium has the right people and the right technology in place to continue being the best browser automation framework out there. Before writing this talk, I had not considered viewing these changes through the lens of the lessons I had gleaned from running the project for so long and being involved in open source even longer. There are, of course, many other lessons that I've learned over the years working in open source and while building Selenium. I hope you've enjoyed hearing about some of them. You might also say that some of, the, some of these uh, lessons are obvious and trite. I never said I was a particularly insightful person, so I'll happily take that criticism in the warm-hearted spirit it was meant in. And perhaps it might be helpful to recap them in a handy slide form. I think we can break the lessons down we've discussed into two camps, the social and the technical. Do the technical ones first. Remember, code lives forever. It doesn't matter whether the code took a moment to write or months of effort. It's very likely that each line you write will live significantly longer than that. Just because of this, it's worth doing the best job you can. Fortunately, if you make a mistake, that's fine, because code is endlessly plastic and entirely disposable. We can edit, amend, and change anything we write. It's not always easy to do that, but it's possible. And if things go wildly wrong, it's okay to admit defeat and start again. And we will be defeated occasionally. Just because it looks easy doesn't mean that it is. Sometimes that thing we think will be easy to do turns out to be something from a horror film. It turns out to be an incredibly hard task to solve properly and neatly. Of course, to give us all some hope, sometimes the opposite is true. The thing that looks daunting and hard to grapple with is actually pretty easy to solve. And that leads me to the next lesson. We should favor simplicity, but don't shy away from complexity. Software and many other things in life have some essential complexity. And if we ignore that, and we don't necessarily solve the problems we need to solve, but we don't need to overcomplicate, and we don't need to overdesign. That leads to accidental complexity, and that's the tar pit in which we suffer. And one of the great ways to introduce accidental complexity is to attempt to write an API or framework from scratch without proper experience of the problem being solved. Down that path lies many traps and pitfalls. I can assure you, it's not something you want to do. But sometimes it's hard to know if we're misapplying our experiences. After all, the path to success is long and filled with hard work. When I started working on Selenium, I had no idea that 15 years later it still wouldn't be done. And there are still problems to solve and designs to explore. It's been a lot of fun. And part of that fun has been the people I've had the pleasure to work with. You see, people matter. And the relationships we have with one another also matter. You can see that daily on the Selenium Slack channels. There tend to be a few people who help lots of others, very often, but 
there are also people gently supporting one another as we wrestle with code or design problem. Occasionally, we talk about totally random things that have nothing to do with Selenium. And that's fine. We're human. And there's power in cooperation. It's only by working collaboratively with patience and understanding that we've been able to build Selenium. It's only by being part of a vibrant and interesting community that we've been able to keep the project rolling and thriving over all of these years. There's no way I could have done that on my own. And I'm very far from being on my own. I've made some great friends while working on Selenium. Some of the people who used to be here have moved on to other work, and I try and stay in touch with them. You see, we should understand that friends come and go, but a precious few who you should try and hold on to. That line came from a song, so I thought I'd paraphrase it for my, pass it for my parting thought. Trust me on this. Writing a spec is incredibly hard work. Thank you all for your time and attention. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. I hope there's some time left over for questions. Thank you, Simon. Thank, Thank you, you, Simon. That was that was fantastic. Oh my God, I had uh, goosebumps that many moments on different slides. Um, it was as someone mentioned on the chat. It's definitely an emotional. Uh, timeline going back in the time and you know, really visiting all of your memories. So thank you so much for sharing. It was fantastic. Uh, yeah, we have a few questions. Uh, let's take it one by one. So first question is from Dennis. Are there any best practices can you, can you recommend to speed up my Selenium testing inter inter integrations? Uh, uh, to speed up Selenium testing, I guess, right? Yeah. Um, so... Um... The, the, the One of the things that I used to do while I was at Google is I'd walk around and I would tell teams to stop using Selenium. Um, and that wasn't stop writing integration tests. That was like stop writing large tests. Like we have the test pyramid, which I know is old and boring and has been discussed endlessly. But the idea of having a large number of end-to-end of -end tests and a smaller number of, of unit tests is something that leads to slower and flakier test suites. So the best advice I could give is um, when uh, you feel the urge to create a new end-to-end -end test, like, do you need to create it? Could you hook it into an existing smoke test? Um, is there anything you can do to um, uh, make this maybe a smaller test, a medium test or a small test? Um, you know, this is like the, the standard classic advice. Um, if you really can't help it, then uh, you need to consider test isolation. So maybe keep the same browser process running uh, that might be one way of doing it, or use a tool such as Lambda or a service even such as Lambda test and run your tests in parallel and let somebody else handle running all the browsers because the heavy thing in that test will be your browser. And if you can run 100 tests in parallel, then you'll be able to get things back faster. Thank you, Simon. Next question is from James Mortensen. I think James is someone who's contributed lately to our project on uh, having an M1. Uh, Docker Selenium uh, compatible oh, yes. images. So he's asking, sorry to go back down emotional lane. Was there any time where you faced any self-doubt about the project and felt like giving up on it? If so, how do you get past this? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, oh, plenty of times. Like when we started, um, uh, some people at, uh, at work were telling me I was mad because writing the way that the web driver does, where you're in the bowels of the browser and you're really tightly integrated, you need to know a lot about each and every browser and sort of scaling that out is clearly a fool's errand, right? There's no way for one person to be able to do that with every browser. Um, and I mean, they were right, but I didn't want to believe them. Um, so I just had to keep on plugging away with that. Um, there have been low points, <laughs> like all the time. You wake up sometimes. It's like, have I got the energy to keep on doing this? Um, and then I remember like the people I work with or the problems we're trying to solve or like there'll be like a little corner of a problem, which is fascinating. It's like, I'll just pick away at that little corner. And then over time, the sort of energy and the enthusiasm comes back like it, I don't, I've never met anyone who is always 100%, 100% of the time. Um, and like, I'm, I'm just like everyone else, right? <laughs> like, yeah. I can't be enthusiastic all the time. 
but uh, whenever I do, just knowing there are people around and there are problems to share is a, is a lovely thing. Yeah, thanks to Matilda for making you <laughs> refreshing whenever you feel down. <laughs> I hope so. She did the job. And uh, I, I hope you will agree to me around the number of selfies, selfies you had around in Selenium Conf India. That, that will actually show yes. you how much people love you and the sort of contributions oh. that you've done to the community. Just incredibly humbling, like whenever that happens. And my family think it's very bizarre. It's like, they want to take a photo with you. It's like, yeah. <laughs> yes. Right. All right. So, um, so Sam, just a different, different thought process, a different question, maybe. So there are a number of tools out there already, uh, which is having their opinionated way of uh, building the framework, uh, which is essentially not following the web driver spec per se, mm -hmm. uh, which is approved by the uh, W3C browser testing group, but uh, what are your thoughts around those tools uh, from a user perspective, right? So we have been talking about from a developer perspective behind the scenes on how people should use W3C WebDriver protocol based tools because it's the actual remote introspection of, uh, you know, a browser navigation, which is out yeah. of context. But um, yeah, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? So, um... When I started working on, on the WebDriver API, I always viewed it as like um, the machine language of browser automation, right? Like we all know that, that computers use machine code in order to do their stuff, but very few of us write machine code, right? We write C or Rust or Go or Java or Python or whatever it is, and that ends up being translated down. Um, so the idea was that you were going to use WebDriver as a sort of building block for more sophisticated tooling. In the talk at GTAC in 2007, I talk about page objects, DSLs, um, and fitness, like uh, functional integration testing. Um, so that's the approach that I always thought people were going to take. Um, and for that, I was kind of expecting like opinionated frameworks to just pop up, right? And, and maybe in the Python world, you see like Selenium Base is one of those, right? Which is like, here's how you do this stuff. And it's batteries included. Um, but it wasn't something that was big in the Selenium community. Um, Tools like Cypress have an amazing UI, right? Like just the developer experience of using it is great. Yeah. Um, personally, I am skeptical about the technology. I think they are basically using the approach we use with Selenium SE, and we abandoned it because uh, it's not great. Um, on the other hand, tools like Puppeteer and Playwright uh, have that bi-directional communication, which it turns out is a really useful thing to have. Um, but the Puppeteer folks are working with us as part of the W3C WebDriver BiDi team to try and come up with a stable API. Because the thing that they don't want to have to do is um, tie versions of their APIs to versions of the browser. They want to be able to improve the API and also um, independently rev the, the, the browser. Um, the Playwright folks haven't joined in the fun yet, but I mean, they have quite a large team being funded by Microsoft to make everything work. And I do have to wonder whether uh, that is uh, the most efficient way to spend limited engineering resources. But, you know, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, so I am bullish that WebDriver by Day will cover a lot of the use cases and territory that people want to be able to do. And that will allow us to explore new forms of, of API and stuff like that. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> Absolutely, I, I think so. I think so. We added a bit more uh, as well, which is definitely helpful. Personally excited for uh, web travel by day as well, but also making sure people not, you know, abuse it just because something is available for the convenience, and then, uh, you know, figure out scratch their heads for uh, future uh, problems. All right. Uh, next question is from Babu. I think this is a good old decade question, which is not very new to you. Uh, I'm not certainly asking for status codes. Um, what is the plan <laughs> for simplifying DevTools API for uh, web driver users? Um, yeah, good question. Um, so the original web driver bindings that Facebook did in PHP for Selenium were, ex were literally the wire protocol. And the wire protocol is a terrible way to try and control the browser. You want something a bit higher to allow you to express yourself clearly. Similarly, right now, a lot of people are using like raw CDP, the wire protocol to try and do things. And that's incredibly painful. The thing that we did in Selenium, so you can see some of this emerging in Selenium 4, is we try and focus on the use cases that people are trying to solve. Um, classic example, there's a network interceptor. 
uh, in the in the Java tree, um, and you pass that a WebDriver instance, and then behind the scenes that uses currently CDP, but at some point Bidai, in order to intercept network traffic and and allow you to to reshape it and send it in different ways and 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 change it in different forms. Um, so that's like how we would tend to do it. We would take a look at the problem you're trying to solve, come up with an API that allows you as a as an engineer or a tester to solve that problem. And then behind the scenes, we would handle the complexity of figuring out like, can we do this with BiDi? Does it need to be CDP? Could we do this with straight web driver? Um, is this injecting just a chunk of JavaScript and hoping for the best? Um, you don't need to know how that implementation works. You should be thinking about the problems you're trying to solve. Um, so that's what we try to do in Selenium 4. And you can see some of that poking through already. Um, so that's the approach I would take. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Simon. I think we're already five minutes past the original schedule. Uh, but it was nice having you. Thank you so much. We're so honored to have you, um, Simon. I think definitely it is an emotional um, <laughs> ride. And uh, there's lots of things as a takeaway. Uh, there's a couple of things that I've already, you know, have, have it in my, um, the other screen that I have, probably I'll take a printout and put it up somewhere. I think the code is endlessly plastic and entirely disposable. I think people <laughs> people love that quote on the uh, comment section as well. And then favor simplicity, don't shy away from complexity. I remember you were saying this to me whenever I was trying to raise my first PR, um, but then I was trying to get review comments over an email. <laughs> I know how <laughs> we ended up having that conversation. I couldn't forget that. But uh, yeah, it was. Um, it's always nice talking with you, Simon. Thank you so much for sharing all of this with us. And um, it's definitely an emotional roller coaster. And uh, we we definitely owe you a lot. Um, and wish you good luck and health. Stay Thank strong. And we we all are with you. Our, our prayers it's are with you. An absolute pleasure to be here. So thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you all for being here and listening and watching. I really appreciate it. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining in uh, different parts of the world. We had people from Kenya, Egypt. Uh, so thank you so much for joining in and uh, stay tuned for the third edition of Voices of Community. Uh, we will be back soon, um, end of next month, and I can't wait to meet you all. Thank you so much.